everybody. Welcome to another episode of Purple Insider. Matthew Collar here. And yes, we are going to give a hardcore preview of a game that will take place on November 10th because... Why wouldn't we? And joining me to talk about Vikings and Jaguars on November 10th, which is week 10 of the NFL season, is one of my favorite beat reporters in the National Football League, John Shipley. Not the John Shipley that you guys know who is from Minnesota, the John Shipley who covers the Jaguars, Jaguars on SI. Uh, one of the one of my favorite guys, and, and great when we can have an excuse to get together. I think what well, we did this with uh, Yannick Ngakwe was the oh, last yeah. time probably we talked, so great to have you back, John. How are you, man? Hey, I'm doing good, man. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm glad to be referenced among the other John Shipley. Every time I explain to people, well, my Twitter handle has two underscores in it. I'm like, there's a guy in Minnesota, him, John Shipley. Beat me, beat me to the punch, you know. So he, he I'm, I'm ha- happy to be back. Damn, man, that trade feels like a million years ago, doesn't it? It most certainly does. Yeah. I mean, at the time, I guess we thought, well, you know, the Vikings are going to get him in here, extend him. He's going to be a big part of the future. And then they went, oh, all those sack numbers, not really what we expected from uh, Yannick Ngakwe. And he still gets out there and gets sacks. He's a free agent now. Someone will sign him. He'll get six sacks. And his PFF grade will be a 32. And <laughs> that will be Yannick Ngakwe. Didn't exactly work out. Uh, but you have had big news uh, in your area recently with Trevor Lawrence. So I wanted to start off with, with this. The conversation about paying quarterbacks. The Vikings paid Kirk Cousins a huge amount of money, short-term contract, mostly guaranteed. It was very hard for them to work around for three years. So the Vikings move on from Kirk Cousins. They get a cheap quarterback. And then when the Jaguars signed Trevor Lawrence to $55 million a year, I just gesture at contract and say, this is why the Vikings did this thing. However, upon a little further investigation, John, it does seem like this will be pretty manageable for a couple years with Trevor Lawrence. And it also feels like the discourse is why I say follow your local beat reporter because you're not going to get, I think, the uh, best detailed analysis of something like this if you watch Emmanuel Acho or something. So <laughs> it, it talk, it talk to me about this, about the reaction to Trevor Lawrence's contract, yeah. how the team's going to work around it, the whole thing. Yeah, well, the, the funny thing is, these discussions really started last offseason. You know, it wasn't like they saw his 2023 season where they undoubtedly disappointed, you know, based on expectations or like, okay, you know, we've seen enough. They saw his run in 2022 to the playoffs, and that was when they more or less said, you know, okay, we've seen enough. They literally just could not actually extend him until this offseason per, you know, NFL contract rules. I mean, it's a contract that you know, it does give them a little bit of flexibility, you know, for at least the next year or so to, you know, maybe be a bit more aggressive before you have to start and really draft guys and stay away from free agency. You know, and Trent Baalke's tenure, you know, he definitely likes to pretend like he's not a guy who spends a lot of money and that he just resigns all his draft picks. But in three of his four off seasons, he spent a ton of money. So they're definitely going to have to pivot now to a team that, you know, isn't doing that as much and trying to draft better and retain their own players. I mean, last year they had a 12-player draft class who I think only one player had a, a – AV of more than, you know, one. So, it, and there was a right tackle who started every single game. Everybody else was, you know, simply not productive. So they're going to need to be a better drafting team because of this contract. But it definitely, you know, once you start getting to last year's of it, like I think 2029, his cap hit is more or less like a meme number at this, at this point. It's like 75 million or something. So I expect them to, you know, probably we work it at some time in the next couple of years as he gets closer to those years. And there are some void years on top of it. The Jaguars have become, you know, one of those void heavy teams, you know, along with Philadelphia Eagles and really the last two off seasons. It seems like every contract they have, you know, there's like board years on top of it. Even Gabe Davis got board years. So it is, it's definitely a contract that it seems like it'll give them flexibility moving forward, but it was something they had already decided to do. And in my mind, you know, if you have already decided he's the guy, there's no real point in waiting a year because it gets more expensive and your answer didn't really change. So either you think he's good enough to pay or you don't. And obviously, you know, he's not developed fully. You know, they see him as somebody who should play better moving forward and they're betting on his potential a lot like some other teams do when they sign these big contracts. 
You know, when we talk about scouting quarterbacks in the draft and everybody's got their take and everything else, one of the things I go back to eventually at some point in total exasperation from the whole process, and I will yell, we don't even know if the current quarterbacks are good. We yes. Ask a hundred people if Justin Herbert's good and you'll probably get more say yes than no, but there'll be enough of go, I don't know, he doesn't want anything. And the same thing goes for Trevor Lawrence where – I think that the excuses for not having uh, this Peyton Manning like uh, alteration of the Jaguars franchise uh, are valid to some extent. I mean, the Urban Meyer thing is most certainly real, uh, and I'm sure that was quite an experience. Uh, I remember you telling me that he like didn't know players names and stuff like that on other teams. He called James Robinson, James, the running back and called. Mm -hmm. Roy Robinson Harris, Roy Roberts for an entire year and called Adam Gostas Alex Clancy after a game. <laughs> James the running back is good. <laughs> yeah, James the, James, oh, the yeah, James the running back. Yeah. Yeah. I, I actually I, I know what position he plays. <laughs> Thank yeah, you. I I actually kind of like it. It's sort of catchy, but if it's because he doesn't know the players names. So anyway, you know, he kicked the kicker, all the different things that happened there. So that was legit. And then it was totally fair to look at the roster that he had, go to the playoffs, get a playoff win, have a crazy comeback, all that stuff and go, Hey, this is it. This is the quarterback he's supposed to be. So then last year when everybody placed their bets on Trevor Lawrence greatness, and then those bets didn't really pay out no matter how many times Zay Jones caught touchdowns out of the back of the end zone. It's reasonable to still look at it and go, I don't know if this is what it was supposed to be. And then also say, is this someone that is going to be able to take you over the top when they are more expensive? Because even if the cap hits are reasonable, there's still a hell of a lot more than JJ McCarthy's is going to be, for example. Yeah, no, I think that's hundred percent fair. I think for the, generational tab perhaps that you know Lawrence received coming out of college you know whether that's you know fair or not he absolutely you know I think to most people's opinions hasn't really hit that standard yet you know just based on on-field production you know what they've done overall as a team I think that the uh, Jaguars factor is definitely you know some context here nine and eight over the last two years like seems you know perfectly average for the Jaguars it's two of the best seasons they had you know in in, in the last decades so just I think, especially from the top down, whether that's ownership or, you know, front office, they see, you know, even when maybe it's not playing their best, they're still mostly competitive. I think they see that as a step in itself enough. But I do think there are, you know, plenty of reasons to think even the team thinks, you know, okay, there needs to be more, you know, there needs to be more this upcoming season. They've made, you know, the investments uh, at, you know, wide receiver. You know, they, there absolutely, I think, needs to be more than what you saw over the last couple, you know, I'd say month and a half of the last season, up until then, you know, he wasn't lighting the league on fire. You know, he wasn't in the running for MVP or anything, but he was coming off some of his, you know, best games. He had a great showdown with uh, CJ Stroud in Houston and week 12. That was, I thought, one of the more like underrated pure NFL games of the year, you know, just two quarterbacks going back and forth. And then before he got hurt against the Cincinnati Bengals, you know, he was having one of the better games again, you know, of his season. So obviously over those last six games, uh, not at all what they needed at the quarterback position. And he has to carry that along with the rest of the team. So I think it's also fair to criticize it and expect more out of him. And when you're paying a guy like that, there has to be more. So I I think they're paying him for what he needs to become, not necessarily for what he's always been. And I'm certain that that injury probably should not have come back from it as fast as he did. And that likely impacted the way that his season ended. And I've mentioned it a few times, but the number of, passes that should have been caught that were not caught. This has been well chronicled by the data people that he has suffered some of the most drops in the NFL. And we'll get to that with how they're trying to resolve that issue. Although I'm not so certain that Gabe Davis is the guy to do that, but I guess we'll see Uh, it when it comes to Lawrence. I think if I was just picking quarterbacks to start a franchise with even contract considered, he would still be pretty high on the list. He would not be Mahomes and probably Stroud has already gone ahead of him because you've got a lot of rookie quarterback contract there. But when you contextualize 
I mean, even someone like Tua in Miami, his first couple of years are just miserable. And then they build the team, they get the right coach. And all of a sudden, you know, he, he takes off like that. I think most quarterbacks are so impacted by what's around them that when you have someone like Trevor Lawrence, the expectation is like, Hey buddy, you're supposed to just take the team. You're, you're supposed to be Mahomes. So if you don't do it and you just go nine and eight, when your team is kind of bleh, then that's not just not good enough. Uh, and yet I watch the talent that he has and think this still should be a top-notch quarterback yet you're paying him at a time you have to believe in something you haven't truly seen yet. It's, it's, it's such an interesting place to be. And I can't decide whether it's a great place to be because if the team gets a little better, this could be a Super Bowl contender because of the quarterback, or if it's a bad place to be, because if that step never comes, welcome to my life from 2018 to 2023, John. Uh, 22. I think yeah, no, 23. Uh, yeah, 23. I think Kirk's honestly a perfect example of it. Of even, you know, J- Jared Goff, another example, where teams are selling themselves on. If they think these are guys that they can at least compete with and win with and make, you know, annual playoff trips with, they're willing to invest in them. You know, they're not necessarily, I think, expecting them to be Patrick Mahomes, even though, you know, like I had somebody tweet at me right after he signed saying, can you make it make sense to me that he makes more money than Patrick Mahomes annually? And no, <laughs> you know, it doesn't make sense. So that's not, you know, how the market works. I think you're seeing teams kind of, you know, I think Kirk level quarterbacks and above teams are willing to marry to themselves. And Trevor Lawrence, you know, isn't top five quarterback yet or anything like that. But I do think he is in that range where you know, maybe a little above, you know, the Kirk level. So he falls in that range of contracts. There are going to be a few quarterbacks in these next couple of years who, you know, probably get the same type of deal. I mean, Tua even can, I think, be considered one of them. It, it, it's a pure hypothetical, but I, when comparing the two, you know, if I think about Trevor Lawrence and Tua's offense, you know, I, that's probably maybe, you know, offensive play of the year type numbers. You know, if Tua's with the Jaguars, then I, don't know, I feel like I'm watching left-handed Gardner Minshew, <laughs> you know, for, for the most part. So, it, obviously, not the quarterback he was touted to be, I think, but I also think a lot of – context has to be added into factors beyond his control, you know, with the Jaguars, how the roster has been constructed, et cetera. I mean, the number two receiver the last couple of years is now receiver four or five in Arizona to, you know, put some things in the you know, uh, context in terms of the weapons he's had. That's the thing. I'm always trying to figure out how much credence do we give to, Hey, his coaching wasn't that good. We're going through this with Sam Darnold. His coaching wasn't that good. The players around him weren't that good. How much of the stats are that? How much are they of this guy has some fundamental flaws. And with Kirk cousins, the left guard became the meme here where it was just, well, if they only had, you know, Will Shields out there at left guard, then they would have been great. Uh, but, or that, you know, he would have gotten him to the Super Bowl, or if it was only the defense, or if it was only, if it was only, if it was only, and if you have to say that for six straight years, then it probably was the quarterback wasn't at a talent level that could take you over the top to get to a Super Bowl. So how do you distribute this? How do how do you deal with like, what, what's, what is, is there a fatal flaw here in his game that has caused this? Can it be worked out? Can it not be worked out? Because with cousins, the fatal flaw was athleticism and aggressiveness, and you are never going to make him more athletic. That's neither of those things seem to be a Trevor Lawrence issue, but yeah. is there something in his game that holds him back from being at that next, next level that his athleticism, his arm talent, all those things would indicate uh, when he was coming out of the draft. For the record, I think it's a great bit that the Jaguars projected left guard, was a Vikings castaway left guard in Ezra Cleveland. So it's nice to see the baton has been tossed. It, it will take probably until about week three or four for fans to say Ezra Cleveland and Press Taylor are the reasons that the offense isn't really going. I, I, I do think Lawrence has some flaws that have carried over. I think even since it's college days, you know, he's a lot of times, you know, I'd say overly relies on his athleticism, his arm talent. You know, you see the advanced metrics and PFF grades on his deep passing, and that's one part of the sword. The other part of it is, you know, he can be reckless at times, you know, whether with decision-making, whether with uh, ball security inside or outside the pocket, uh, in, outside the pocket, you know, and scrambles and stuff has been an issue for him. And sometimes I think, you know, trying to do too much, you know, and I think especially the situational awareness has, you know, been an issue. I think back to week 18 when, you know, he called his own number and tried to get the ball over the top of the end zone against Tennessee Titans on fourth down. Didn't get it. They didn't run the call play. You know, he had just decided to do it. But in that situation, you know, they were 
about a yard and a half off. It wasn't like the other times they've done it. Just stuff like that. Uh, early down interceptions in the red zone. He still had issues with that last year. That's something that's kind of plagued him, you know, throughout the last couple of years. So there are definitely areas of his game that he needs to sharpen up and areas, you know, why, like you said, guys like CJ Shroud are, you know, probably already passed him. You know, if you had to ask me to pick one today to build around, it would be Shroud because of, like you said, you know, the years of contract as opposed to, you know, Lawrence just now getting paid. There's an erratic nature to his game that I am at times so wowed. Like th- there was that comeback game he had what two years ago, just like, oh my gosh, everything the guy throws is magic. And then other times there's a like skittishness or a scr- like, I got to scramble. I, I'm not seeing it. Something's not right there. And I guess that connects to like, is it, you know, the coaching, is it the receivers or is that just part of his game? I feel like I still saw that in Clemson, but in college you could just do all that stuff and it works. Yeah. He's got more golden retriever to him than people like to admit. I feel like, People projected him out of college as this like pro typical pro style, you know, quarterback, like the next like Peyton Manning. And when really, you know, he's more in the build of like those uber athletic quarterbacks who are maybe raw, you know, in some areas. Now he's a lot more athletic than, you know, some people I think might even still, you know, give him credit for. You know, that's probably his best trait is still, you know, his creativity and what he does on the move. But it's also what hurts them, you know, at a lot of times. So I, I, I think, you know, turnovers and situational awareness specifically are the two things that, you know, moving into next year, they have to see him take a step in. Because like you said, if you're entering several years of maybe it was this, maybe it was that, you know, eventually in the NFL, you simply just have to produce. So how good are the weapons? Uh, I mean, Evan Ingram catches eight yard passes <laughs> and a lot of them. And that that is another thing with, with uh, Lawrence that's sort of this conundrum is, you're talking about his erratic nature, how he likes to run around. And yet a lot of times he'll be throwing like four yard throws and you go, you all right, buddy. Like, do I need to shut it down and restart it? Uh, and then he'll average six yards an attempt and you go, uh, I'm not sure what's happening here, but you know, okay. Ingram, he's a decent player. Thomas is a very exciting prospect. Christian Kirk. Uh, I think that the contract that everyone went absolutely berserk over for Christian Kirk has been fine for them because receivers are extremely expensive, but I still don't look at this. And, and maybe this is just being in Minnesota where if you have anything less than Randy Moss, Chris Carter and Jake Reed, you're like, nah, you suck. Uh, but, uh, I think it's an okay group, but it doesn't look like, yeah. wow, this is going to take him to the next level unless Brian Thomas is fantastic right away. Yeah, no, it definitely is. I think, like you said, probably an okay group, you know, at the, at this moment. I mean, still the best receiver Lawrence ever, ever had in his career is now playing for, you know, a divisional rival. You know, even if Calvin Ridley maybe didn't meet every single expectation, he was still a 1,000-yard receiver uh, coming off, not playing for a couple of years. So I do think that their offense got hurt, you know, to a degree by losing Ridley. Uh, it, bringing in Gabe Davis and – you know, Brian Thomas, as opposed to losing Ridley and Zay Jones, I think they lost the best receiver. They also, I think, replaced the worst receiver of the four and Zay Jones. So I think some middle ground can probably be found there. And I think if you're looking for any optimism, you know, in terms of the pieces they have brought in, like you said, Gabe Davis isn't anybody who's going to solve uh, your team's drop issues <laughs> exactly. But if there is any optimism, it's that, you know, Lawrence's best style of play complements both of those guys, you know, you know, big receivers who win downfield. But like you said, there have been so many times in the Doug Peterson press Taylor offense where they've been that dink and dunk team where, you know, like you said, Evan Ingram or Christian Kirk will catch a six or seven yard pass over and over and over again. So the Jaguars have at different times, you know, kind of unleashed Lawrence, but at other times, you know, they've played it safe on offense. And I think especially when turnovers hit them, you know, at some point during the season, if they ever get into a turnover slump, They've, I think, have shown to go towards that direction. Just, dear God, get the ball out of his hand. <laughs> and, you know, try to eliminate the chances of a turnover. I also don't think last year they trusted their offensive line very much for a variety of reasons. They had, I think, nine different combinations of starting, you know, left tackles and left guards during the season. So they turned to a quick pass again because of that a lot. But if there is any hope, I think, for this offense, it's one that, you know, maybe Thomas and Davis fit him more than guys like Zay Jones and perhaps even, you know, fit-wise than Calvin Ridley, even if he's clearly the best of the four. And then, two, I think if there's 
some optimism that they can produce with Lawrence. It's that most of the receivers he's played with have had their career years under him. You know, uh, Kirk and Ingram, obviously, Zay Jones, uh, Calvin Ridley had a 1,000-yard season with him. Jamal Agnew looked like a semi capable NFL receiver the last couple of years. Even LeBron Treadwell got like 400 yards and I don't think has played a game since then. You know, so if there's one thing Lawrence has been able to do, it's boost the production of his receivers, even if it hasn't, you know, seen his production take big leaps. Teams keep signing Laquan Treadwell. It, it just uh, continues to happen. If you're a first round pick, you got a job for life. Someone yeah. will always bring you in and be like, Hey, you know, what if there's uh, more there than whatever to and there, there usually isn't, uh, when it comes to Doug Peterson, I, I want to ask you a question that a beat reporter would hate, which is how many coaches would you take before Doug Peterson? Because hmm. yeah, I think his, I'll give you a second to think about it. His reputation is naturally that, uh, you know, he won the super bowl and was really great in that season that they won the Super Bowl with Nick Foles. He gets credit for that forever, but the league changes quick. Frank Reich at one point looked like a great coach, then suddenly didn't look like a great coach. Um, where does Peterson stand in all that? Would, would you say that he is still ahead of the game or maybe needs to update some things or uh, where? how you feel? I do think last year absolutely showed that they do need to update some things. It seemed like they felt like they could run back the exact same cast, exact same offense as it did the previous year. No need to make major tweaks to it because it just worked a year ago. And then you fast forward, you know, to 2023 and that same offense they ran, you know, it just in terms of pure efficiency numbers took a major step back pretty much every offensive metric. So I, I do think that he's a guy who him and, you know, Chris Taylor, who have kind of been tied at the hip since – uh, you know, the Philadelphia days and it looks like we'll continue to be tied to the hip until the end of days on <laughs> this earth. For, for whatever reason, Pre Press Taylor, you know, is his guy and we'll follow him everywhere. And you know, it's those two who construct the offense. It does seem like coming off last year, they need to update some things. I'd say like outside of the top 10, he's not in that elite tier, but I, I'd say, you know, probably somewhere in that, you know, 13, 14 range. Like obviously you're taking the Mike Tomlins, the, John Harbaugh is even maybe, you know, potentially Jim Harbaugh, uh, the Andy Reeds over him. But I, I do think that he has shown that he can at least raise the floor of a team, which again, for the Jaguars, the bar has not been high for some time. And so far he has cleared that very low bar, but I do think now expectations are starting to rise more and more like, okay, be better than the nine and eight record. But I do think there are a lot worse coaches you can probably have. Yeah, and we're talking about some of this stuff as if it was a disaster and they went through a lot and still came out with a winning record last year. So it's not like it was a, a complete mess. But I, I think that with the Jaguars, the big question is, can you go from there to anywhere else? Uh, a friend of mine in the league likes to say it's very easy to go from two wins to eight wins. It's not that easy to go from eight wins to 12 wins. So to go from that middle, and we saw it here, to being a team that's legitimately competing for the Super Bowl. And I, I've wondered if Doug Peterson still has that in him or if every time a team has a bunch of injuries or the receivers aren't good or something, we just go, idiot coach, am I right? And uh, I try to weigh uh, how much belongs in each category. But I think that raising the floor is a good way to describe Doug Peterson, where you have a professional coach yeah. um, like before. <laughs> and so you're guaranteed. I think what you're guaranteed is if the players are good and they stay healthy, you're going to be there at the end of the day. Uh, and you can't control some of the other stuff, like who gets hurt. Yeah, no, I, I think that's definitely a good way to put it. You know, there are definitely, you know, areas of his tenure the last two years that, I think both can be admired and both can be, you know, kind of questioned. I mean, anytime you load a divisional lead after starting eight and three, you know, you, you have to bear, you know, some blame in that, no matter how injured the players might've been. I mean, they, they played Joe Flacco and uh, Jake Browning, you know, in that stretch, you know, and lost both those games. I think the big thing with the Jaguars last year is they were expected to take that step, you know, after going nine and eight the year before, and they're expected to hang with the top teams they played. But you look at the top teams they played last year, you know, they lost to the Chiefs, they lost to the Ravens, they lost to the 49ers, didn't even compete really with the 49ers. Uh, the Chiefs game was not nearly as close as the score may have indicated. I think a lot of games last year showed that the Jaguars were still far away. Now, they've made a lot of 
I'd say veteran additions this year. Uh, they've gotten rid of uh, some guys maybe from past holdovers from, from past 10 years. There's been more roster overhaul this year than I think maybe people even expected. So maybe they hope that culture kind of shifts where they actually feel like they're one of the NFL's top teams because it definitely felt like a confidence issue at the you know second half of last year as things started taking the skid. You know, you could see each game that they were losing a little bit more and a little bit more confidence to the point where the only team they could compete with was the Carolina Panthers, which, I mean, they were able to beat them with C.J. Beathard. So that shows you the state that the Panthers were at last year. Yeah, that's true. It, it was, uh, I mean, when they started the season the way they did, I think everyone went, this is what we expected. Like that's, it's kind of just the natural progression. You tank, you have kind of a middle season like Detroit did and then contender. And then you just, then the easy button happens. And then you come up short in the playoffs and everyone hates you and talks about how much you let them down. Like this is football. And just, we go around and around forever. And for them not to take that step, uh, that puts you a little bit in, in limbo, I think. And especially with the division. So here's a question I like to ask guests of the NFC North of, if you were looking out a year to 2025, say, what do you think the order of the division would be? Because what you have is high draft pick quarterbacks, teams that have rebuilt and now look like potential behemoths, of course, in Houston, but even Indianapolis, if uh, Anthony Richardson is something, they could win eight games with Gardner Minshew last year. Like they could take a big step forward. And then Tennessee, I don't know. There's just vibes in Tennessee at the moment. Still. If Will Levis is a thing, I don't think he will be, but if he is, then all of a sudden you have all these quarterbacks in the division. Which team is the best positioned over the next few years, do you think? I mean, that's a great question. I think right now you got to think Houston is the best positioned just because they have so many of their stars. You know, Jaguars have, say, Trevor Lawrence and Josh Allen. Texans have C.J. Stroud and Will Anderson, two really good duos. The Texans are on rookie contracts. Well, the Jaguars just handed out the two biggest contracts in franchise history, you know, to their pair. So the Texans probably have a lot more flexibility. Uh, I, I think the Colts are a fascinating, you know, answer potentially for number two. Obviously, a lot of it relies on if Anthony Richardson hits or not. I thought, you know, he was solid last year when he played. The obvious question is, how can he avoid injuries, especially with his play style? And he played the Jaguars in his NFL debut. And there were several times he took, you know, some of the harder hits I've seen an NFL quarterback take in a game, like two or three different hits. And he was doing that off the rip. So it's, you know, maybe, you know, if he can respond to that and change up his play style, I think that he can potentially lift them to be that playoff type of contending team. So see them in the Jaguars, kind of interchangeable as two and three. Maybe put the Jaguars in front of them because you know the quarterback, while not elite, has at least shown you that he can get you to playoff capability. And I'm with you on the Titans. I think Will Levis, you know, definitely flashed some things last year. Like, I think he's better than, say, like a Desmond Ritter. But I'm also, if I'm a coach or a front office executive, I'm not hitching my wagon to Will Levis. He does far too many Will Levis-like things to (laughs) make me uh, feel as confident in that as the Titans seem to be. But like you said, Titans seem like they're – yeah, they're just vibing that right now. This entire season for them feels like they're trying to figure out if one dude can singularly play. and Everything else that happens around them is, you know, gravy. Yeah, I will be interested in it because the Vikings had an opportunity to draft Will Levis. And uh, I know for certain, well, not because just because they didn't pick him, but they that was not their guy. They, they looked at him and said, nah, nah, we don't view him as our franchise quarterback. So the fact that the Titans said, maybe we do, or maybe we just pick every guy that drops to see what happens and we'll be right one of these times. Uh, but that, yeah, that franchise doesn't seem like their roster is anywhere close and their coach has to prove himself as well. But everybody else, it is kind of a, a three person race. So I want to ask you about one other thing. And then I got a fun thing for you um, on the defensive side. And I refuse to be the show that's like, let's talk about the offense. Let's talk about the defense. And then you just, what, one of the worst podcast or interview questions is just like, so what are you seeing on the defensive side there, John? <laughs> and you're like, did you, did you think about this for two seconds before <laughs> you had me on? Uh, so I'm going to ask a very specific question. It, do you just attract top draft picks that people like to argue about? Because Trayvon Walker it seems now, now I'm seeing the debates. Is he actually good? Is he not good? Well, he got some sacks last year, uh, but the PFF thing. So like good, not good. Should the Vikings be scared? I mean, I, I think the Jaguars definitely have pieces. And I think when you look at the defensive staff they brought in, you know, you can look at it as a potential upgrade over the last staff and scheme they had just in terms of Ryan Nielsen, 
being more of a established defensive coordinator than Mike Caldwell was. Walker, I think, wasn't as good as 10 sacks would say. You know, his, I think pass rush win, win rate was, I want to say, in the 50s of qualifying edge rushers, something along those lines. Uh, he wasn't like Josh Allen, who was consistently not just getting sacks, but also getting pressures. Uh, so I, I think Trayvon is probably better than the public consensus, which is, yeah, people kind of label that pick immediately as, oh, wow, we wouldn't <laughs> have done that. So it's probably a little bit better than people thought of that. But, I mean, you still debate today, you know, him and Aiden Hutchinson. Aiden Hutchinson, despite some of his own flaws, you know, not as good in the run as Walker maybe, he's still a significantly better pass rusher by pretty much every pass rush metric. So I definitely think still the wrong pick. But awful player, no. Elite player, I, I, I don't think so either, you know. Not as good as the 10 sacks he showed last year. But, I mean, the fact that he showed any life last year, I do think is at least a positive because he, he definitely looked rough at points as a rookie. All right. Something that we talk about all the time, every single person who covers an NFL team is guys taking the next step. And so you get from the, like, hey, if he takes that next step, and this is like the theme of the podcast, can the guy take the next step? There are examples of year three pass rushers. Rashawn Gary is maybe one of those who were thought to be raw, freakish athletes that finally hit their stride. I forget, I guess uh, with Daniil Hunter, maybe it was probably a little faster than that, maybe year two, but it wasn't until year four that he was a double digit sack guy really consistently. Cause even in 2017, he had like eight and a half and then he made that full progress. And there might be a comparison there because if Daniil Hunter was coming out in the draft now, they'd take him in the top 10 for sure. Considering what he is as an athlete, how do you feel about him taking that next step? Because I think that's a swing to the entire defense. If he gets 10 sacks, but as an all around pressure machine to go along with Josh Allen, then you're talking about something that's very dangerous there. Yeah, no, Daniel Hunter, uh, that name sent a shiver up my spine. I can't tell you how many different stories I had to write about the Neil Hunter rumors and the Jacksonville Jaguars. I, it, it, it was the sweetest irony that he ended up signing with a complete division rival and the Jaguars seemingly would never even in the race to sign him. I, I, I mean, I think there are maybe signs that maybe Walker can be that type of player. My comp for him coming out was Rashawn Gary because Rashawn Gary even played inside at times for Michigan. You know, he was seen as kind of a tweener coming out just like Walker was who Walker didn't really play edge truly until he got to Jacksonville. You know, he went from playing essentially a five technique def slash defensive tackle role to coming into NFL and learning three, four outside linebacker for the first time in his life. So you definitely saw a uh, learning adjustment to that. I, I think there are some traits from him that you can see, you know, you th all the traits that obviously made Trent Baalke uh, salviate for him at number one overall, the length, the explosion, it's there. Uh, I, I would say one thing the Jaguars maybe haven't done is move him around as much as people initially thought they would, you know, especially he was an interior player coming out. He was talked about as a mismatch you can use throughout the formations. And uh, I think he played maybe 30 snaps inside over the last two years. So they've already talked about that kind of changing under Ryan Nielsen. Ryan Nielsen's obviously a defensive line focused guy. Uh, that's how he, you know, made his bread and butter. You know, he was the guy at NC state when they put out four different defensive linemen in one draft. So I think he's going to be more or less his pet project because they need him to take that step forward. And maybe if they utilize him differently, maybe you do see him take that step, but he's also somebody who, you know, while you've seen it happen before, I'm still not willing to bet on him passing, like, say, a guy like Aiden Hutchinson this year. I just – with him, I think you just have to wait and see it because while he had a great into the season last year in terms of the sacks, his pressure rate still never really hit that consistent rate. He never really has in his career. So I think until that happens, I'm still going to be, you know, a little bit wait and see on him. Yeah, I think that's fair. And with someone like Trayvon Walker, he didn't draft himself there. And yeah. uh, what he needed to get from point A to point B is not what you normally expect from that draft slot. You expect be Miles Garrett and be Miles Garrett today. And that is just probably not who he's going to be. Uh, that decision may end up haunting them a bit with Aiden Hutchinson being the player he is, but that always ends up resting on the shoulders of the player. Oh, you should have drafted somebody else, whatever the, uh, the Sam Bowie instead of Michael Jordan type of thing or whatever, you know, that's just, it's going to rest over him. And I think that's, that's difficult for a player when they know sure. everyone's saying, Hey, they should have drafted somebody else. Um, any player who says they don't see that stuff is, is not telling you the truth. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I, I would have been fascinated to see where Walker would have got drafted 
if the Jags had taken Hutchinson, because I, I do think maybe the narrative had shifted too far on him when he was drafted. People were making it sound like, oh, a late first round pick is going number one overall. When in reality, it seems like he would have gone fairly early. I'm interested to see maybe if he even would have gone, say, number two to Detroit. But it does seem like narratives have really kind of taken the shape of his first two years. Yeah, totally. I think he, I, but I remember looking at him and seeing, per, you know, maybe top 10, top 12, yeah. something like that. But to have someone jump all the way to one, it's so notable. It's such a recognizable sure. pick. Um, so that's kind of, you know, something he has to deal with beyond just trying to become a good player. What Vikings questions do you have for me? What do you want to know? Who Who's starting week one? Quarterback. Oh, Sam Darnold. Sam uh, Darnold. I think so. Who's starting week 10? That's a harder question. Yeah, that is a oh, much yeah. harder question because week 10 against the Jaguars, we will know how they dealt with the start of their season. And if you have looked at the Viking schedule, as we were both trying to find it on the internet uh, before the show, it's not easy. You got the Texans there. You got the Packers there. You know, there's a, a buy after London and then they play Detroit. There's a chance that if Sam Darnold doesn't play well, it looks pretty nasty by those first few weeks, uh, because this is not a complete team. It's not a Super Bowl team that could just drag bad quarterback play to a bunch of wins. Uh, they're going to need Sam Darnold to be very good right out of the gate, or they're going to get behind in the season, which could result in JJ McCarthy. I've looked at coming out of the bye against Detroit as a good time, potentially for McCarthy, if they're like a two win team or something, but then we're also trying to weigh this you shouldn't just play McCarthy because Darnold's not good. Yeah. You should play McCarthy when he's ready to play instead week 10 could very well be Sam Darnold. There's also a universe and maybe you've heard this one before with Blake Bortles or whatever there, but it is plausible that if you give a very talented top draft pick, Justin Jefferson, Jordan Addison, these tackles, this coaching staff, there's more there than there's ever been there before. And with Brian Flores' defense, they could win some games. So if they're like a 500 team when they're traveling down to Jacksonville and I've been there for three days already playing golf, which is my plan, by the way, then uh, I think it could be Sam Darnold still. I, I really think they want to take this super slow with J.J. McCarthy. Yeah, and I, I think, you know, if you ask the Jaguars how they handled Blake Bortles, they probably regret playing him, you know, as early as they did. I remember... It, it, it was such good gaslighting. They, they they said they picked him and they would take him slow. You know, he would develop behind Chad Henney of all quarterbacks to develop behind. And that lasted about two and a half games until he got inserted into a game where they were up by 30, down by 30 points. And they never, you know, obviously looked back. Okay. My next question would be, what was your take on the draft night trade that Dallas, uh, Minnesota, my apologies, ended up moving up for Dallas Turner that, the Jaguars, you know, it, one of the most unlikely friendships, I think, in the NFL, Jim Balky and Kwesi actually go way back, you know, to early San Francisco days. Uh, it seems like, you know, Trent always willing to do business with Kwesi. And he he had high compliments, you know, of him after the first night of the draft just for him and, you know, uh, the kind of front office, you know, executive that he is. What was your take on the trade? I, th I think the Jaguars obviously – you know, they claim they were going to take Brian Thomas at 17, as every team does after they trade down. We'll never know, but they obviously, I think, see it as a positive because they operate on next year's time a lot of times. They're not a front office that feels very much pressure. <laughs> so they're obviously always looking toward, you know, next year if they can. What was your take on it? So my thing is that uh, I am a, a big fan, as you know, of analytics and data and uh, draft charts and all those things. But I think that everything with those types of numbers requires context. Um, a player like Dallas Turner, who is projected as a top 10 pick, but falls because there's six quarterbacks. So like he didn't fall that far with actual position players, but gets pushed down to his draft slot because of six quarterbacks. Do we adjust the draft charts for that or not? Because quarterbacks have so much more value. They break the chart, right? So there is that. Uh, also, the fit with Brian Flores. If I right. was to go into Madden and try to build a player six foot three, 240 with a four, four and a 40 inch vertical and played for Saban and lined up in different places and sacked the bejesus out of quarterbacks like crazy in college had the production, the combine They're like every single box is checked. And the other thing is too, that if you add one more pass rusher to this thing with Jonathan Grenard, at, who's only, I think, 26, 27. He could be here for years. You create this pass rush duo, 
And then the foundation is there to build the rest of the parts through free agency. But you know what you can't get in free agency? Hey, how many how many articles did you see last year where people are like, 10 teams who should sign Josh Allen? And the yeah. answer was, <laughs> nobody's freaking signing Josh Allen. He's no. staying there. And that's no. what mostly happened. You know why? Because they're hard to get and they're super good. And your value difference between a rookie contract and a veteran contract with edge rusher is darn near what it is for a quarterback at this point when you're talking about an elite edge rusher. So that surplus value matters. So I looked at it as you really have to peel back the layers of this rather than just saying, well, they gave up a lot. Like, well, yeah. they did give up a lot. But if it works, you have... 30 million in surplus value for a guy who is a flawless fit for your defensive coordinator. So I kind of look at it similar to the Texans where sometimes like for Will Anderson, you just got to go for it. And for if sure. it fails, it fails, but if it succeeds, it's going to be really good. That's how I looked at it. And not many people, I think a lot of people who initially disliked the Will Anderson trade would probably tell you they still disliked it. But I mean, if you're looking at the Texans proje- trajectory right now, I mean, do you care at all <laughs> about, you know, the, the, those picks? I mean, he's obviously a, a star player. I well, One of the most amazing bits of my time covering the Jaguars is seeing Trent Paulke slowly become, like, semi-analytically pilled. He said at one of his press conferences before the draft, he was like, the analytics will tell you, like, to never trade up. And, you know, it, it, it just seems like, you know, he's somebody who – in the moonlight stages of his career has now, you know, kind of seen the light on it and he's trying to make his unlikely relationship with it work out. Yeah, that's interesting. And I, I mean, I really think that that was a trade that just worked out for everybody. It's like the Jaguars need more pieces and more picks and uh, the Vikings badly need that game changing edge rusher that they haven't, well, they had in Daniel Hunter, but they haven't had a duo since Everson Griffin was here and really at his best in, in 2017. And, and to, with Flores, the thing is, too, if you have a player who can move around, who's versatile, who could drop back in coverage, Flores compared him to Dante Hightower. And you're like, if that's any version of what the guy becomes, that's going to be a huge impact player for them. So, you know, it's one of those things where we will absolutely judge it on the result um, rather than I think that the the people who say it wasn't good process aren't looking at maybe the bigger picture of where this defense is. So anyway, before I let you go, John, uh, here's what I want to do. I want to give you a former Jaguars quarterback, and I want you to tell me where you think that quarterback ranks all time in passing yards in franchise history, because this list of quarterbacks is hilarious. It is one of the funniest lists. It's not as funny as the jets, but it's pretty funny. So it's, it's quite bad. So I, <laughs> I was talking about like the Jags quarterback history in the context of the Trevor Lawrence deal. And somebody replied to me like, well, imagine being the bears. And I was like, Jay Cutler would probably be in that running for best Jags quarterback ever. And Rex Grossman, as bad as he was, is probably a top five. It's, it's a pretty good list. It's, it's, it's quite a bit. Right. Uh, Mark Brunel, obviously the uh, grand champ of all Jacksonville Jaguars quarterbacking. Where do you think Quinn Gray ranks all time in Jaguars passing history? Just going off yards. Quinn Gray. Ninth. What? You nailed it. That, that's really? right. A top, yes, because I laughed out loud when I was looking <laughs> at this before the show. Top 10 Jaguars quarterback ever. Quinn Gray with 1,252 yards, 12 touchdowns, five picks. Not terrible for Quinn Gray. Good for yeah. you, pal. It's uh, uh, well, well, oh, say, go ahead. I want to say it's Mark Brunel. Then is it Blake Bortles or Byron Leftwich at number two? No, David Garrard. No, it's David Garrard number two. Blake Bortles right at the first three. Time. It's, Bo- it's Bortles at two. Okay, Bortles at two, Garrard at three. Yes. Uh, Lawrence at four. Yes. Leftwich at five. Yep. You said Gray's at nine. Uh, where's is Rob Johnson in the top ten? <laughs> Rob Johnson is twentieth with okay. <laughs> two two games and one start. But that start, you know this. That start resulted in the Buffalo Bills trading a first round pick for him, <laughs> and then the owner becoming so obsessed with him that they benched Doug Flutie for a playoff game <laughs> because Doug uh, because uh, Rob Johnson had had a good week seventeen. Uh, so uh, a great position in uh, history. I was going to get to Rob Johnson. Also another former bill quarterback, Trent Edwards yeah. was a Jaguar. Oh, man. Where's he yeah. rank? Uh, dang, that's a good question. Let's go 12th ahead of Josh McCown and somewhere after Nick Foles. 
Okay, you remembered way more Trent Edwards than there actually was. He started one game and threw for 280 yards and three picks, and he's 21st. How about this, though? How about this? The Vikings played against, was it Jake Luton who started that game? Or was it, no, Mike Lennon? It was Mike Lennon. So where does, uh, and Mike Lennon tried to scramble, and Jordan Brailford, who was a Viking player, stripped him as he was trying to run and it looked like a giraffe. So uh, where does Mike Glennon rank in his 0-5 starts? That was quietly a wild game. <laughs> Honestly, it, it was, actually was it, very entertaining. It was. They, they had a couple games like that when they had like Jake, like they went down to the wire with Green Bay at Lambeau with like Jake Luton at quarterback or something. Had all the different scenarios where they could have lost out on Trevor Lawrence because of Jake Luton, Gardner Minshew, and Mike Glennon. God, that, that, that also feels like ages ago. I'd say Glennon. All right, so if Edwards is like 20, 20, and then Glennon started five games, Glennon's probably let's go fourteen. Top ten Jaguars passer in history. Number ten, Mike Glennon. That's insane. What, what a time! Uh, I would Cody not have guessed Kessler, that. Uh, I'll give you two more. Cody Kessler, who uh, when the Jaguars had joint practices with the Vikings in I think twenty eighteen, I think it was eighteen, eighteen or nineteen. Uh, I remember watching Cody Kessler throw and going, this, this guy's, he's like on the team. <laughs> and uh, that's my break. And he was much better than Blake Bortles. And that was my takeaway in that practice. I was like, is this a, it's like a camp body or no, he's on the team. He could actually play. <laughs> okay. Okay. God, I want to say he started, did he start what? Three games, four games, four games. Okay. It's kind of a cheat to tell you how many games they started, but yes. I'll go 11. He is 14th, just behind Jaguars legend Nick Foles. Ah, there we go. Yeah. Okay, last one, last one. Uh, Do I go? I'll go with, uh, I believe this is a former Viking. Did Jay Fiedler play here? He did, right. Yeah, he played here. Okay, former Viking Jay Fiedler. 28th. That's a good guess, but no, he threw for 656 yards, 16th on the list, ahead of CJ Beathard, ahead of Luke McCown, Jake Luton, and another Viking, Todd Bauman, who had a quick run there in Jacksonville. What a magical, magical list. Of that makes me realize, I said Josh McCown earlier, it was definitely Luke McCown. But Luke McCown, yes. The Ben yeah, Baldwin, Josh- his Alec Baldwin, yeah. Josh McCown is here and he is not Ben, uh, David Baldwin. <laughs> My bad. Yeah, no. Absolutely. I, <laughs> slip. Yeah, no. I, I, the Jaguars like complete like era of quarterbacks from like post Gerard up until Trevor Lawrence. It's just the complete, it, it's up there with, you know, the Browns, I think of recent times as the most recent, you know, funniest list of quarterbacks because the, the, the road to Lawrence and it, it was just absolutely impeccable in terms of, the different swings it took on quarterback Scabbert, I'll never, you know, forget uh, doing a story on the night they drafted him. Jack Del Rio had no idea that they were <laughs> drafting him, was getting a plate of food yeah, from catering and saw on the TV the Jaguars had traded up to draft playing Gabbert. And that obviously set up a great, great relationship. Oh man, that's great. Yeah. Uh, I believe he started this 2016 game against the Vikings and, um, didn't go so good. Did not go so good. So anyway, well, the crossovers are always funny and great to get together with you. Uh, Jacksonville version, John Shipley. It, it needs like parentheses, not Minnesota John Shipley that everybody knows. So uh, great stuff, man. And uh, look, there's a game in was that, was about four four months, four and a half. We'll do it again before then. It'll be fresh. We'll have the same conversation oh, yeah. <laughs> only we'll know who's starting. So no, I really, I really do appreciate p- people should follow you on Twitter at whatever version of John Shipley looks like it's a Jaguars reporter. And uh, <laughs> you're, you're a great follow. I really enjoy your work and uh, hopefully we'll, we'll do it again soon, man. I appreciate you having me on my friend.